and thanks everyone for coming along. Um, for those who, yeah, as mentioned, I'm the uh, current executive director of the GNOME Foundation, or if you're English, I'll say the GNOME Foundation, because either, either way of pronouncing it is fine. Um, those who thought that this is going to be, ooh, what's GNOME going to do over the next five years or so are going to be disappointed. Uh, I'm afraid this is not a technical talk and looking through latest feature sets or, as Reddit would have you believe, working out which features we're going to remove next. Um, this is kind of something around the importance of free software and the desktop and why this still matters. So I wanted to kind of walk through a bit of where we came from, um, have a look at some of the challenges that we're facing today, and a bit of a look at the future or potential futures that could happen and to express that we need to stay vigilant against some of these problems. So, um, in the long and distance past, uh, people's access to computing was through mainframes, essentially. So you had a sysadmin who allowed you to use the terminal and allowed you time on their computer, and great. Except the actual users of it, therefore, had no freedom whatsoever. And then in 1993, the uh, Debian project was cooked up, and that's kind of where I first get involved into, into free software systems. And this produced some interesting new aspects, not just the software or this concept of user freedoms, but new ways of working the power of communities for people all over the globe to come together and collaborate and be able to work in an entirely online environment. But still around that time, I remember I had one of my first programming jobs. Um, it was for, it was doing a website for what was probably the largest photo hosting site at the time until Yahoo gave Flickr a load of money and then we kind of went bust because we couldn't compete against that. And I remember that Internet Explorer was the dominant force. A few strange people use Netscape Navigator still, but it was essentially Internet Explorer and you had all the quirks. <coughs> then fast forward a bit to uh, 1997. Uh, Mid Miguel Lingaza and Frenico Mina created the GNU GNU Network Object Model Environment, or GNOME, as we all know it. And so there was this start of a push to try and put users still in control. But in general, people didn't really understand this. They thought, uh, well, this headline from uh, 11th of February 2000 from CNN was quite enlightening. Is free software communist? So, so quick look at, um, at, at kind of my personal history as well. I first started with free software about 17 or 18 years ago. Interestingly, it was with a friend at university who um, <coughs> downloaded CDs and then of Linux distributions and then sold them. And I think slightly before that, he was selling floppy disks with root floppies on, on how to do that. And we've come a long way since then. My first uh, distribution was Mandriva, I think. That was it. Or Mandrake. Whichever one came first. It keeps changing names. Um, and then moved on to Debian. Um, my first contribution there was packaging a client called Dribble, which was for a service called LiveJournal. And those old enough to remember that will know that this was blogging before people invented the word blogging. Um, and then I've had a various history. Interestingly, um, I'm I served on Software in the Public Interest on their board, Open Rights Group on the board there, which is here in the UK, kind of the UK version of the EFF. Um, heavy involved with Debian, obviously, and now GNOME. And I also... Um, on the Network Operations Committee of OFTC, somehow. Um, they, they keep electing me back to that, despite me not actually doing much work at the moment. But 
okay, that, that happens. So I wanted a quick look next at kind of the present day and, and kind of where we are. So for those who saw Bradley's keynote yesterday, this kind of touches on some of the same topics. There has been a meteoric rise in free software. And there are people who say free software has won. And in some ways, it has. The use of Linux in everything we use now, from Internet of Things, mobile computing, servers, you and especially recently the news that um, that GNU Linux is now, in terms of supercomputers, is now being used on 100% of the top 100 servers. In fact, I remember when I was Debian project leader, um, a very strange thing happened. We had a new release of Debian. Now, I know that seems strange in itself, but we did manage to release. And then a press release got sent out by someone else congratulating us on the new release of Debian and saying that there will be free cakes for everyone to celebrate this at Linux Fest Northwest. And that press release was from Microsoft. Now, this is certainly a strange thing that I never thought um, would happen. And it's not just the adoption of free software usage by itself, but also our model of distributed development. That ability for globally diverse people to be able to contribute together. And people are using that model, but still possibly not quite understand it. I couldn't come to a free node conference without putting this on the, on the slides. Interestingly, this is kind of their headline is where work happens but they still don't quite understand it because if you want to go work for Slack, you have to relocate to San Francisco. <laughs> oh well. So the so I'm going to have to keep on looking at my uh, phone. Uh, my There's an interesting bug in LibreOffice where the presenter mode suddenly just disappears with your notes sometimes. So I need to try and remember what I'm meant to be talking about on this slide. Um, so what does this mean for desktop and desktop GNU Linux? When there's more cloud everywhere, then where's the relevance? If everything's in a web browser, then what does it matter about what's running on your personal computing? And we've seen things like GNU Linux and free software in many different areas. So automotive sector, in healthcare, in indeed in your toaster. I have a friend who got a new dishwasher and they had a look in the instruction manual and they said, okay, so you put in the salt here, the washing here, water goes in here, and there's a copy of the GPL. Excellent, because what it does is it displayed a little thing saying how long, projected a thing saying how long's left onto the floor and that is literally using free software inside it. But do we care if your car happens to be running GTK? Then what does it matter if there's no user freedoms at the end of it? If people aren't in control over their own computing, then do we really care that, you're, that you can modify your toaster? So a bit about the future. Now, I should point out I am terrible at predicting the future. When I think the iPad first came out and tablets started to rise, I thought, oh, look, a massive oversized telephone which can't make phone calls. That's never going to happen, and how wrong I was. So bearing in mind I am terrible at predicting the future, the year, no, no, no. It's not the year of the Linux desktop, and every time someone says that, it gets pushed back another year. But I will make a anti-prediction, if you will. The concept that the desktop is dead. 
we just need to continue to push to try and ensure we have those user freedoms. When there's no desktop, then people lose that. And it might not just be you and I. There's important areas which we need to carry on working, and GNOME Foundation is quite keen to ensure that we carry on pushing it. And three main areas I think that we can continue to outstrip um, proprietary software is around accessibility, privacy, and those user freedoms. And those freedoms should be for everyone. It shouldn't matter if you were born without sight that you can no longer access computing or you have to pay for it. And it shouldn't matter that, for example, if you have a very expensive internet connection, then you are cut off from accessing personal computing. And I simply cannot counter that you should be willing to give up your identity to an organization to be able to use your own computing devices. As an indication, I don't know if anyone here has tried to use Windows 10. Pop your hands up if you have. Some, excellent. Put your hand up if you've tried to use it without an internet connection. <laughs> what works? Yes, so, so uh, <laughs> just for the stream, uh, you, there's a weird hidden option in the install process and then you have to disable your network driver and then if you don't, then what applications work? Any idea? The Photos app. Paint doesn't. Because <laughs> it wants to see you to sign up to OneDrive. Great. And, and this is not some theoretical thing where I say, expensive internet. In Indonesia, for example, there's certainly some areas where you will pay a quarter of your income for your net connection, and that gives you 50 megabytes a month. So this is not a theoretical thing that, that oh, my, I've got rubbish internet at home or something, or my cable provider's not doing something. This is a real thing that people need. So a quick look at things that could happen in the future. For those that don't know, last year, about 12 to 18 months ago, there was a series of terror attacks in the UK. Um, fairly quickly after that, after every single one, we had uh, Theresa May, who is our current Prime Minister, um, before she was obsessed with Brexit, um, deciding to do something else, almost as trivially. She wanted to ban encryption. Now, for I, I'm not sure they, that she quite understood the impact of that. Every phone, every Internet of Things device, every car would break. And it's not just governments that try and undermine these user freedoms. It's any for-profit company. And by allowing the use of uh, proprietary software, then this is something that will happen, and we'll see. Two examples. Does anyone know who this logo belongs to? Yes, yeah, so Cambridge Analytica. Wonderful minds at Cambridge, my home city, decided to suddenly take all users' data, conflate it, and then be able to target people with it. And it was kind of interesting because my father recently told me about a story when he, which apparently I said when I was 15 or 16, I said, don't put all your data online. Please don't give it all to Facebook. This is all terrible. 
things are going to break. It's a matter of when, not if. And, um, and strangely, he actually did that. So he doesn't have a Facebook account and actually cares about data privacy. But the Cambridge Analytica one is particularly interesting because now all his friends, when he goes and plays golf with them, are now all talking about it as well. So we do have the opportunity to um, take that conversation and take those things which we have been doing and carry on moving forward to create a force for good. Jim Zenlin, head of the Linux Foundation. 2017 is officially the year of the desktop. I'm not quite sure how he gets to decide what official is and what officially happens. Slight problem with his talk. He was presenting on one of these. <laughs> so even those who are friends of GNU Linux, even those, as Bradley mentioned yesterday, even people who care about user freedoms, we need to care about it for ourselves. The layers of indirection and the hoops you have to run through to produce free software or use free software on macOS is incredible. And yet, thousands of people do it. Millions of people do it. Is it too much to ask to say, if you're producing free software and you're using free software to do it, could you maybe please use free software on your desktop to do the same? And this is something that we actually care about a lot at the GNOME Foundation as well, is about the developer experience, um, which is a wonderful phrase that's then come from user experience to developer experience, and I'm sure we'll have design experience or various other experiences next. Um, but that's why we've done things like Builder, which is GNOME Builder, lovely ID. It's basically you can copy and paste a Git link in there, and it will download it, compile it, run it, put it in a flat pack so everything works, and you can distribute it. I think one of the companies that's involved quite a lot with uh, GNOME called Endless Computing, they did a really interesting one where you can have your program running, and you click on the top right corner, and it flips around into Builder with the code live, and then you can edit it, and click run and it flips around again and there's your, your running changes. These sort of things is what we need to try and appeal to those developers themselves. So, I'm aware that I don't have unlimited time and I would like some time for questions as well. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of wrap up. Um, so, I think we need to bear in mind why we're doing things. It's about those end user freedoms, and it's about putting those, that power back into the hand of those end users. And if we manage to do that, then our future with self-driving cars, with healthcare machines, and with your toasters might just remain secure. So you can be at least safe in the knowledge that when you're being driven to the hospital in your self-driving ambulance, it's running free software. And that your healthcare machine, which you get plugged into, your ECG or whatever it is, is running free software. And I should point out, I think one of the largest manufacturers of healthcare machines like that, it runs GTK and Wayland. So these are things that are actually happening. And yes, you can be I suppose, delighted when your piece of toast pops up in the morning and emblazoned into the top of it is a copy of the GPL. Um, so thank you very much. Um, I welcome any questions anyone has, either on this or GNOME or life in general. Excellent. I can't really see. There's a big bright light in the way. That's fine. <laughs>
Um, I guess one of the things that I, I'm, I'm sort of aware of, because I used to work in education and sort of um, administrating systems for education, um, one of the biggest things people always seem to think when you talk to them about free uh, desktop experiences, so move them over to GNU Linux, introduce them to GNOME, KDE, anything like that, is a certain, um, there's a certain apathy towards them because they are unfamiliar. Um, and yet, obviously, people are very willing to switch between Mac and Windows, even though those are completely unfamiliar. But um, I, <laughs> I guess the, the sort of question is, you know, what effort is being made um, to target the education sector, and particularly things like primary schools, where they don't necessarily have the big influx of money from Microsoft, like uh, private colleges do, um, and are actually in a position to get people involved with this very, very early on so that what a computer is to them is sort of more open. So, interestingly, the biggest operating system that's now used in the US in K-12, which for people not aware of that system, that's kindergarten until year 12, so century primary and secondary school in the UK, is Chrome OS. Everyone's using Chromebooks. So there is that move there. I mean, the, the bigger question around where, where people become unfamiliar with something, I think that is being used as an excuse. When Windows 10 came along, there was a massive change. Metro mode changed a lot of things. When the new Microsoft Office suite came out and introduced the ribbon bar, there was a huge amount of change. No one knew where to find anything. And still, when I try and occasionally have to use it, I struggle to work out how to change a page or, or something like that. In terms of education, there's quite a lot that um, we are doing. Um, I'm involved with a group um, to try and push more free software, especially in uh, universities and higher education. That, that has its own sets of challenges as well uh, because, um, <coughs> because some of the nature of free software and the way it moves around a um, lot and is very volatile does not make for ideal teaching notes or course content that you can keep for the next three years and then ignore. Uh, in the UK, there was something that was particularly interesting, which I think um, other countries should also look at, is that Francis Maud in the government office um, decided that, after some consultation, that all government documents should only be available in three formats. Four formats, text, HTML, PDF, or open document format, ODF, brilliant. And this suddenly removed actually some of the big blockers I've, I've ha seen in the past when schools say, well, we, we can't adopt um, a free operating system because it doesn't work with these Microsoft Office documents which we get from government. And so there's just no way of doing it. There is also, I think, a, a, fear of a, a fear of the unknown and people being used to, um, to Microsoft Windows being the, do the dominant thing. And so that's why schools go, well, everyone uses Microsoft Windows anyway um, in the workplace, so we need to be people to be familiar with that. And that is changing. So I, I think it's kind of a chicken and egg problem, but that... Um, us keep on pushing free software on the desktops then would lead schools themselves to go, oh, okay, there is an alternative and there is something we can do. So rather than trying to change all the schools' minds, which is going to be a problem, partially because there's so many of them, I think we just need to do it through our constant efforts to carry on pushing the desktop. <coughs> Not sure if that answered your question or if that's just a five-minute ramble from me, but hey. Any more questions? Ah. <laughs> oh, I forgot.
got my question now. <laughs> I think someone's got one over there. <laughs> First, Neil, thank you for your long-term contributions to free software. Oh, thanks, Chris. I think um, it's Chris. <laughs> what have you changed your mind about and why? What have I changed my mind about? Yeah. As in over the last... Yeah. What did you first think and now you don't think that? Three things, probably. So the most striking one uh, was the concept of system D. <laughs> Love to be controversial. Um, see. In which direction? <laughs> <laughs> so I originally thought, it's like, I'm not having any of this. This is what bundling this stuff together, binary log files, this is all terrible, and the world's going to end. Um, and then I kind of made an error, which is I actually used it, and it was nice. Especially the binary log files bit. That's fantastic. Um, the I mean more generally, I, uh, I don't think it's just me that's changed our opinion, but what we're doing and how we're doing it is slightly changed. As more people have access to computing and more people use things, then we are seeing different types of contributors arise. I mean, before, certainly in the early days, it was entirely coding. There wasn't any concept of design. There wasn't, people didn't want to get involved. And I think that's changed quite a lot and our collective understanding of what is a contributor has changed. And now when, when, when I say that GNOME, for example, is designed, I don't mean just made to look pretty. Um, that is part of good design, but what we try and do at the GNOME Foundation is a considerable amount of user testing. We put things in front of users and then ask them to do things and then observe to see what happens. And that's where the design of GNOME comes from. That's why things can be put in different places. That's how we work out how to do uh, progressive options so that the most common things that people want to do are nice and in front and forward, but the more specialist things are hidden slightly behind that. So it makes for a better user experience because that's what people actually do. So between that and we're starting to see marketing happen and we're seeing a lot wider range of users coming in. So I used to think that it was entirely technical in what we're trying to do. So let's just make free software and then people will use it. And I've certainly over the last 15, 16, 17 years, come to realize that that's not going to be enough. We have to actively reach out to places <coughs> and to groups of people that we haven't reached before. We get one last I'll, 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 I'll repeat the question, what is it? <laughs> Um, so the question is um, targeting uh, targeting developers and targeting users. Are these two competing things or are these two separate things or are they the same thing? Um, I think one is a subset of the other. Um, essentially all developers end up being users. What we want is people who are developing things actually using that themselves at home for doing their everyday stuff as well. Um, our ability to attract and keep people on those desktops is, is kind of linked to both of them. So that's why we have, have things that are designed to be easy to use and designed to work well, like GNOME Builder was written as an IDE for GNOME developers to use, but also for other users and other people to be able to use as well. Um, that's why we have the foundation is um, backing things like Flatpak and FlatHub as the distribution platform as well, to be able to work both for those developers and the users. 
and being able to get software into the hands of those end users. It, essentially, a developer without any users is useless because people are just writing software into the void. And similarly, users can survive without people making stuff happen and, and move it forward. So they're, they're kind of intertwined together. And I just personally get really annoyed every time I see someone with a MacBook writing free software. For GNU Linux systems, if people want to write free software targeting Macs, great, more free software on Mac OS, brilliant, we can do that. But it just does get annoying that I see all this money going to a proprietary vendor with proprietary <coughs> software and then claiming that they were the first big open source company, which was odd. I think it's because they um, th because they used uh, the Darwin kernel and then dumped some code somewhere and then said, hey, there we go. But Red Hat was founded before that happened with OS X, so I'm not quite sure where they came. But we need to be careful to make sure we look at the motives of the companies and make sure that it's happening. Again, another slightly rambly rant, but yeah. I'm, I'm also getting odd looks. I'm good, excellent. Uh, one more question, two more questions? Uh, it's fine, we'll do one last one. Now. One, one, okay. What, what do you think the impact of projects like the Raspberry Pi have had on Linux and education? Um, the impacts of Raspberry Pi on education is, so, so I, in Cambridge, I might have got to see a Raspberry Pi or two before they were announced and released to the public. Um, I actually ran some code on it before they, they were released because of the strange way that Cambridge works and everyone knows each other. Um, I think the it's incredibly important what's, what's kind of happening there. Um, <coughs> firstly, the device is interesting in itself. The very fact that you can get the Raspberry Pi Zero W for five dollars, a general purpose computer, five dollars is in outstanding. And they not only within education, but have changed entire industries and the concepts of the way they work. Previously for digital signage, so something like there's a monitor down here or the things you see outside, that used to cost just the bill of materials for the devices running those was over $150, and they often retail for five, six, hundred dollars per, per device. And now people just go, oh, well, we can just use a Raspberry Pi with it. The other impact it's had on education, I think, has been to change the policy around it. Because for many, many years in the UK, um, we dropped computing in favour of information technology or information communication technology. And I remember when I was small, I actually went to a, a, a US school in Japan. So that's kind of interesting. Um, Ask me more about that strange experience afterwards if you want. But um, we used turtles, I think they were, the little things you programmed. You say, turn right, go forward 10, turn left. The basics of actual computing and programming. And what we're starting to see now is actually this is starting to be taught again, especially as we realize that actually just using a, a spreadsheet somewhere isn't good enough. And we need to be able to actually go and develop things and actually use things. And I think the Raspberry Pi um, Foundation, beyond that, has been largely responsible for a lot of that change, along with, with others as well. Um, and it's becoming really interesting to see the, the new generation actually growing up writing code again. So I think that's probably it. So thank you very much for your questions, everyone. And, uh, Hand over to Crystal, I guess. <laughs> Thank you very much, Neil.